Have you ever heard of a story that was so exciting and tense that you were practically sitting on the edge of your seat waiting to find out the ending? It's terrible just to miss the ending, isn't it? Charles Dickens, who wrote such classics as A Christmas Carol, A Tale of Two Cities, Great Expectations, also wrote a serialised novel called The Mystery of Edwin Drood. Dickens' plan was to publish the novel in 12 instalments in a monthly magazine. In the sixth instalment, Edwin Drood disappears under mysterious circumstances. But sadly, shortly after the publication, Charles Dickens died. His last novel, unfinished, and readers will never know how or why Edwin Drew disappeared. It's no wonder Charles Dickens is credited with creating the cliffhanger. You know, that moment, that unresolved tension in a story that keeps the readers begging for more, to know the ending. Charles Dickens knew how to keep his audiences on the edge of their seats. And I think our Bible story today has some cliffhanger moments in it. So come with me to Christ last night on earth and the greatest prayer of all ever prayed under heaven. Here Jesus prays this beautiful prayer to his father and one might say reviews the mission that his father had given him. Here, his disciples experience that cliffhanger moment in their journey of discovery about who Jesus really is. He had been their teacher. He had been their friend. They had seen him do marvelous things. Feed the 5,000, heal the leper, raise the dead. But they also witnessed crowds turning against him and they saw him crucified. But then on the third day, he rose from the dead and made appearances to them over the next 40 days. But now he has to say goodbye to them. And Luke records the event like this. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised but stay in the city until you've been clothed with the power on high. Jesus then led them out into the area around Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he was taken up into heaven. They understood. They worshipped him, returning to Jerusalem with great joy, staying in the temple and praising God. But who was this man who had walked among them? Certainly no ordinary man, foretold by the prophets, risen from the grave, ascended into heaven. Surely he is who he said he was, the son of the most high God. Ascension Day tells us three things. It tells us who Jesus is. It tells us what we are to do and where the power comes from for us living as Christ would have us live. Jesus knows that there's little time on earth. His time on earth is short now and he will soon return to the Father. And as he prays, he expresses how he has completed his work he was sent to do. Jesus acknowledges that it was the Father who had given him authority over all the people in, in order to bring the message of salvation to them by revealing the one true God. And Jesus asked his father to protect them so that they'll be one with him as he is one with the father. Verse 6 tells us, I have made your name known by those whom you give me from the world. They were yours and you give them to me. And that's us. He's telling us that salvation is not received by human merit, 
but that is the act of the sovereign God who by grace saves us. From his personal experience, Jesus knew that the world was a terrible, tough place. And that's why he asked the Father to protect his disciples, as I say, including those who follow, including you and me. He prayed that God would keep his chosen believers safe from Satan's power and that they would be united through the truth in knowing the one true God. And Jesus tells us clearly here how we get eternal life. By knowing God the Father. And how do we know God the Father? By entering into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, his Son. And Jesus' prayer fills this whole chapter. I've only read 11 verses. It's the longest prayer we have from Jesus. And from what we learn, if we didn't know already, that the world is a battleground where the forces of Satan's power are rampant. Jesus was a great teacher. He taught public, publicly through the veiled messages of parables. Then he spoke more directly through the like of the Sermon on the Mount. But often he taught his disciples privately. Remember when he told them that it was better to serve than to be served? That humility was more important than power? To die to self and live for others in order to gain eternal life. Throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus' grace is demonstrated in saving sinners, his compassion, bringing healing to the sick, feeding the hungry, his power revealed through the raising from the dead. And Jesus brought about miraculous cures of mind, body, spirit, to show God's love for the people. He never missed an opportunity to help another person especially those who demonstrated great faith. Remember the woman with the hemorrhage? She believed that all she needed to do was touch the hem of his garment and she would be healed. And she was rewarded with Jesus' words, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. Or what about when Jesus cured the Roman centurion servant because of his trust? And Jesus replied to him, Truly I tell you, in no one, in no one in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus cured paralytics, opened the eyes of the blind. He cast out evil spirits from the possessed. He raised to life the son of the widow of Nan, as well as his friend Lazarus. And Jesus demonstrated the great quality of forgiveness and how important it is. Dismissing the sin of the adulterous woman, even forgiving Peter, who had denied him three times. And here in John, we find the love of God demonstrated and explained as nowhere else in this chapter, and it is surely a high point. For John, Jesus' passion, his crucifixion is not shameful and a shameful end, but a glorious turning point in the story of the world's salvation. Here we are allowed to glimpse the very essence of Jesus' soul. Here we see, first of all, the inward prayer, or inward emphasis of this prayer. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. You need to read that a few times. There's a, it's powerful what's in it. We can never get any closer to someone than when we know them and we know their prayer life. So it's not overstating anything to say that we come to this chapter, we really are treading on holy ground. And we should come with a spirit of reverence and humility 
expecting the words to touch us and to fill us in a very deep way. Secondly, Jesus prays to the Father about what he has achieved. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Jesus had left his rightful place in heaven to set before the world an example of perfect living. Now, we're never going to achieve it, but we should be in there trying. He had not given in to Satan's temptation in the wilderness, and he was tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin, says the writer to the Hebrews. He had been clothed in human flesh for 33 years, and now he prays, looking forward to the return to the glory that was his by right. Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. In verse 4, Jesus turns the focus of his prayer upwards with a statement about the Father's glory again. He looked up to heaven and said, Father, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. From Bethlehem to Calvary, the Lord's ministry on earth reveals what God is like to people. Before Jesus, the, the best representation that people had of God was a message through their religious leaders. But it was a harsh, a judgmental, and essentially a, a message lacking hope. Jesus brings a new vision of what God is like. John in his opening gospel says, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only son who is, who is close to the father's heart, who has made him known. Then we read uh, the outward emphasis of Jesus' prayer. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Knowing about Christ, we try day and daily to follow him uh, as he has taught us. But sometimes these stories from the New Testament can seem so unreal, removed far from our lives and experiences that we, we stop listening to them, we stop reading them, we even perhaps stop believing them. Have we stopped expecting God to act with great power in our world? Have we stopped expecting God to save lives, to change lives? Do we expect to walk out those doors to that to this morning the same way we come in? The disciples of Jesus were never going to be the same again. And because of their belief and their prayers and their commitment, they spread the message of Jesus Christ almost to the ends of the earth. I say almost because it's still a work in process. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we have been given the exact same promise and the exact same calling as the disciples all those years ago. Until the message of the love of Jesus has reached the ends of the earth, we still have work to do. Someone once asked General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, about his calling and how he had changed so many lives. General Booth put it like this. From the day I got the poor of London on my heart and the vision of what Jesus could do for them, I made up my mind that God should have all of William Booth there was. And if anything that has been achieved, it is because God had all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. What could God do through you and me? If he had all the adoration of our hearts, and the power of our wills, and the influence of our lives, giving our all to God begins with asking Jesus into our hearts, exchanging our own priorities for God's priorities. When we admit our sin and turn away from it, Jesus lives in us by the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus assures us, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. We are held in the hand of God. And the Father and I are one. Our salvation is not depending on us holding on to God. But Christ Jesus, our high priest, securely holding on to us. As the disciples stood there on the day of Christ's ascension into heaven, there was no questioning his identity. It had all been revealed to him, to them. The ascension of Christ settles forever the question of who Christ is. The ascension of Christ settles forever the question who he is. And in those last moments, he gave them their final instructions. This is what is written, he said. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Jesus' last instruction to him, them was that they were to be witnesses to all they had seen. And Jesus calls us to pass on the baton we have received from those early witnesses to the next generation, to tell the story of Jesus and his love. And as he promised us this, his spirit to guide, to comfort, to empower us. If we were to review our lives as Jesus does in this prayer, would we be able to say honestly, we have witnessed, in humility, shared our faith, prayed for others, encouraged some, been generous with our time, our money, and in joy exalted the name of Jesus. My prayer for all of us is that we seek to serve our Lord until we meet again. Amen.